Hey, bag facts here. I sort of have a bag problem. Uh, not sure if you could tell, it's, it's, it's pretty uh, subtle. So I will make this video to justify all of my purchases because you know, if it's a business expense, it's good to go, right? And you gotta spend money to make money? Still spending that money. In theory, at some point, I should be making that money. I don't... In the context where civilians use firearms, we find it's either defined or linear. Someone hadoukens your front door at 3 a.m., you shoot him in the face, done. Elapsed time, 30 seconds. Rounds expended, three. Sustainment needed, zero or it's a much larger complex scenario where figuring out how to keep your meat suit alive is just as critical as your capability to unalive others while not being unalived yourself. In the context of disaster and shit hit the fan preparedness, the gunfight is the smallest part of your preparedness plan. Support gear for everything before and right up to that gunfight, assuming it even happens, is critical. And thus your bag, your home away from home, is all that stands between you and being warm food. That's inappropriate. So the big one's the female, huh? Women are often the larger. You know, people are acting all shocked. Like, I can't believe women are so fat these days. It's like, no, women are supposed to be fat. You're supposed to be tiny, and she's supposed to bite your head off after intercourse. To bring back a term from the great warrior sage, firepower versus mobility. Except here, it's more like, you know, weight or payload versus mobility, you know, whatever. Dude, let me have my nut and fancyism, all right? Back off. Well, I don't want to get into why you might be dicking off in the woods with your bros. I've done those videos at great length. I'm going to be focusing primarily on the bag component. So in any scenario, but especially tactical ones, your time in transit is a vulnerability. Your ability to do cool guy ranger shit at a moment's notice matters, and your ability to avoid no-win scenarios like being forced into a fight because of an inability to divert is most important of all. All of these are contingent on your physical ability and the weight of your pack system. So today's systems or discussion will be on different bag sizes. Bigger obviously means you can carry more, which not only means longer mission times, but the ability to extend a shorter mission, more flexibility, and cushioning in the event of unplanned events. Smaller means while you have tighter margins, you can move at a much faster rate while also being able to do more stuff because you don't have a literal child's worth of weight strapped to your back. It's more like an infant. Getting into the actual pack topic here, a metric that we're going to be using to categorize bag size is the term assault pack. We have the two-day assault pack, the three-day assault pack, and then a rucksack, we'll just call it. I'll be also adding a made-up category called the LAP, the large assault pack, to bridge the massive gap that's kind of uncategorized between your typical three-day assault pack and the rucksack. For those new to this, assault pack does not mean and this might be shocking, that it needs to be used in an assault. It's just the name. Similarly, the time nomenclature means no, almost nothing for our context. 48 hours, as implied by a 2DAP and 72 hours out of a 3DAP, is bordering on pipe dream status. This will be a reoccurring theme, but also your environment will heavily dictate what is an acceptable amount for sustainment. Dudes on the East Coast can basically live off of a Capri Sun and a box of crackers. Meanwhile, I go out here and I'm going through four Nile jeans in six hours. So on that note, you will see me throw the term, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours around a lot. Understand, these are highly dependent on your environment. When I put these numbers out, I'm talking about environments where you can only realistically resupply water maybe once a day at best, and food resupply is completely pointless, and temperature fluctuations mean that you actually need a real sleep system. As mentioned, there are environments where you basically need, you know, seven MREs, a water filter, and you're good to go for weeks on end. You don't even need a sleep system, but that is absolutely not the norm, and I'll be approaching it more from the more extreme side of things. If you find your environment to be a lot more temperate, well, then obviously you can shave off some of the requirements that I mentioned here. I'm very much approaching it from the more extreme side of things. It's also very much a balancing act. More is not always better because we do, in fact, want to run the lightest pack possible because we consider this, so to speak, a tactical environment. It's not just getting from location to A to B. It's the doing so fastly with a lot of tactical gear on you, so on and so forth, with the risk that that entails. Isn't going to sustain you. You can't actually eat bullets. And the notion that no one was ever upset about having 12 magazine only applies when you don't have situations where you actually run out of food and water in the middle of nowhere. In those scenarios, people do in fact complain about being overloaded with tactical gear and underloaded with survival gear. It happens all the time. This video, once again, is sponsored by our friends at Venture Surplus, a really, frankly, perfect sponsor for this video. We're going to be talking about bags. 
lots of bags. And the military tends to get offered a comical amount of bags, bags that you can buy at a significant discount. Merger Surplus has a variety of not just bags, but the support items that you will need to put in the bag. Pouches, food bags, stuff sacks, and even MREs. Despite the near universal hatred towards these things and their soy beef sticks, these things are actually hard to beat in terms of weight and bulk for field exercises, especially if you gut them and remove a lot of the extra packaging, and they don't require a fire or stove. And somehow, these actually typically cost only slightly more than your typical mountain house meal, while being way more satisfying. I don't know about you, but I love snacking on things instead of one big large meal, so uh, for these exercises, I tend to actually just bring MREs. Anyways, thanks for Venture Surplus for sponsoring this video, and you should go there, now. <laughs> Starting this off with the humblest of packs, the Assault Pack. The Assault Pack is a really small 10, maybe 20 liter system, for sure is going to hold water in the form of a hydration pack. Typically, you can hold a couple Snickers, MRE, rain gear, extra layers, and maybe if you're lucky, it has a pouch for a bump helmet for night vision usage. The big goal and design feature of the Assault Pack is not to compromise your agility with unneeded weight, and to hold the bare minimum, honestly in a lot of cases less than the bare minimum, to allow for short movements, assaults with high intensity events, or long-term low intensity events like guard duty where you kind of just want to bring some stuff with you. Something like the Eagle Yote Hydration Pack has become very popular recently due to its ability to stash a helmet on the outside, and because T-Rex Arm shows it off constantly in his media. Personally, I'd steer you more towards an Eagle Industries Beaver Tail Modular Assault Pack, what a fucking name by the way. Uh, like the Yote, it can be worn standalone or interface into a molly or shoulder strap of a plate carrier. It's really functionally just the same pack, but it's not made out of a fluorescent bright color, which as an aside, some people are gonna say, ah, but it's gonna look more gray man. Dude, you're wearing a rifle with kit. Let's not kid ourselves. The term gray man does not apply here. Anyway, the beaver tail modular assault pack got that name. Unlike the Yote, you can actually buy it on various surplus stores and save a couple bucks. The assault pack that I typically use quite frequently is this knockoff flat pack from Haley Strategic back when I was in college and the premise of spending close to $200 on a micro bag uh, really did not appeal to me. Actually, in fact, that still doesn't appeal to me. Anyways, it's the perfect size to include something like a helmet, extra food, extra water, and generally like a windbreaker or something like that, and works really well in this environment. I typically attach it to my plate carrier. No, I can't get to it quickly, but for the type of events where I need high intensity, low bulk, low snag, well, it, it works quite well because, well, I can just have someone else pull it out of it. None of this is time sensitive, right? This here is the DG3 extension pack. It clips on top of the DG3, kind of where you know the, the lids typically go and replaces that. It works as the lid, but you can also detach it and use it as a, well, backpack. So it works really well in scenarios where perhaps you're gonna run this DG3 pack or rucksack uh, for more of a base camp type scenario where you're setting up a hide and then you want to punch out to like an OP or something or do an assault or you know do whatever your imagine, imagination desires, leaving you with a much lighter pack, keeping you light on your feet. The way it's configured means it's not very good for anything else because it's two small packs and not one big large compartment. So you can't actually carry much of anything in here. So while in theory, you can have adequate calories, water, food, whatever, especially if you're in a temperate environment with an assault pack, it's important to realize with the assault pack how tight your margins are gonna end up being. So for me personally, I view the assault pack as exactly that. A pack meant for an assault in a very relatively, very short duration, high intensity event where I'm still proximal to a patrol base, a car or my actual home. And I personally typically only will even consider using something like this in an urban environment where uh, exposure is not an issue at all because you can always bail out into a house or a structure. This is some... Is that your round or mine? I don't know, this is some David Copperfield shit. What the fuck? Mind freak. <laughs> <laughs> it's in a spider web. Oh, it's in a spider web. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh okay. <laughs> the next category is the 2DAP, 3DAP. This is kind of my favorite category for the lack of a better term. These are basically two variations of the same design. The two-day assault pack is a much larger pack compared to our previous assault pack, coming in and over double the volume, typically around 20 to 30. And the three dap is a hair larger than that, at about 30 to 40 liters, give or take. 
Yes, I know, uh, we're using liters, but liters are far more convenient than cubic inches. And whatever, you know what a soda bottle is, which for some reason is measured in liters. So we're gonna be doing liters. Anyway, the typical pack has room for mission critical gear and roughly around 24 hours, maybe 36 hours of food at a medium exertion level. You can have room for extra medical gear, probably water filtration if relevant, windbreakers, certainly socks, and maybe a very light sleep system or sweater or something like that. Extra sets of clothes, a comprehensive sleep system, tarps, tents, and typically other stuff uh, are gonna be generally pretty brutal on a two-dap system, especially when you consider that the scenarios where you want more things like more clothes, more comprehensive sleep system, tarps, whatever, the setup of base camp, uh, are also the same scenarios where you also need more food, more water, more whatever, and you'll find the two-dap generally is gonna begin to come up short there depending on how much room you have. The two-dap and three-dap is sort of a delicate balancing game because you certainly have a lot of space to bring a lot of things, but simultaneously, a lot of times you're going to need to leave stuff behind that you typically want to bring with you and then kind of just tough it out. A big thing there is like sleep systems, for example. The end goal or weight that is possible with the two dap, three dap system is about 20 on the low end, 30 to 40 on the high end, and then you add in a chest rig and rifle and you're gonna end up at around 50 pounds of total. That with an acceptable level of fitness, you can still also fight with it on your back. I view it as the ideal bag for most scenarios where you're doing like a one day reconnaissance, two day reconnaissance kind of thing. Maybe a three day if you do uh, you know, some extra prep work for it. Some good examples of this are the Mystery Ranch two-day assault pack or the Mystery Ranch three-day assault pack. Like the entire Osprey lineup basically fits into this category, though most of these bags are quite fluorescent with their colors. Uh, a lot of the issue military packs are often right within this range, like the USMC Fibble, Fible, Fibbly, the Army 3DAP, and many others. Once again, Venture Surplus. Because these are issued gears, you can get it for fairly cheap, and it's honestly just a great part uh, place to get started. These aren't worse variants of what you can get in the civilian sphere. As you'll see momentarily, a lot of these are very much no-nonsense style packs, and are actually quite good for a lot of scenarios. All right, let's get into some of the versions I've personally tried. Remember, this is just what I've tried. I, I, I can't try every bag on the market, despite my dream to one day do so. Uh, these are just ones I have personal experience with. The 2DAP is really quite good. I've used this on the channel for quite some time. It's really kind of just the perfect size. And with a hard backing on the inside, it really can handle varied lows without kind of just crumpling. Personally, the more time goes on, the tri-zip functionality just kind of comes off as silly and I almost never use the front zip. A lot of the advantages of the system also get eaten up because it is exclusively designed for a hydration pack, which means the pouches on the left and right aren't very good for actually holding any water and the interior water pouches for actual bottles eat heavily into the overall bag space. Regardless, I ran it for a while. I have reviews on the channel. Let's move on. This Camelback, I've discussed this guy a lot on the channel as well. Uh, I believe this one was an issued pack at some point as well. I don't really remember, but it's really quite a good choice. And it's very efficient with its uh, space and size because it has one giant compartment and the secondary compartment doesn't actually eat into the space of the primary compartment like you'll see with a lot of other bags in this category. I really like this bag. My big issue with it is that I don't have the backer for it or I don't even know if this came with a backer. So this thing tends to beach ball really heavily when you put it at capacity. That is the, the part that touches your back tends to bow out and you're basically carrying a giant ball. The 511 pack here is the, the, the Amp 24 is Hop's favorite pack of all time. He loves this thing, so of course they discontinued it because the world is designed to spite him. It's actually really quite a smart design. We have a very aggressive backer, so this thing isn't beach balling, and it's got a very large single compartment, which I think is the, the better design choice when making a two to three dap style bag. There just is not enough room to efficiently use multiple compartments, in my opinion. My issue with this bag and other bags that you'll see is that it both wants to appeal to the tactical crowd and the tactical crowd that uses these for college or work. There's a lot of design considerations here for pens, paper, pencils, and of course a laptop sleep because it's obviously doubling as an EDC pack. The Dragon Egg here is actually in a similar boat. I, I, I like this one slightly more than the 511 pack and I ran this one for a little bit as well. 
uh, once again, it's covered in EDC considerations. The entire front bag is basically for you to put EDC bullshit in, like battery chargers, laptop chargers, whatever. Now, this isn't a death sentence. A lot of these things actually end up being kind of useful to have uh, camera chargers, uh, notepads, range cards, information, first aid kit fits pretty well in here, etc. So you can still use all of these, this, this extra functionality, though some of it is distinctly redundant. And you can't actually fit anything in this forward compartment because it does bow the bag inward and take up from your main compartment. Overall, it actually still works as a great design, and it's very quite compact for how much room you get. So it, it does actually work very lightweight and allow yourself to continue to move, shoot, run and gun, whatever, with the bag on you. And it also actually has real, ba uh, real pouches on the side to use bottles, because I'm a boomer, and I like bottles, and I hate hydration packs. Next up, we have the Kanai Phalanx. I also reviewed this one on the channel, so you can kind of go look at that video. But basically, it's a really good bag in the three dap kind of range. A lot of space. We still, once again, have that EDC functionality, so there's a lot of spots to put pens and papers and laptops. But overall, it works out quite well, and I've actually done a lot of hiking with this thing, as well as a lot of shooting. Great bag. They don't make it anymore, so who cares? I can tell you what I have in my pack and what I do, but that's never gonna be the catch-all solution because my skill level, your skill level, my experience, your experience, and most importantly, honestly, your environment will heavily dictate what you can and cannot get away with. So for example, for me, a two dap or three dap is bordering on way too small for winter times because while I don't have to carry as much water, freezing temperatures, which you may never have, combined with the need to change clothes because of sweat and melt and the potential inability to make fire, requirement of sleeping bags and bivvies, all of this means I need a large increase in bag volume, so I can't really get away with a 3DAP in the heart of winter. As a, as a detour and something maybe that I'll discuss in the future, there are certain configurations where you can run a really light 2DAP, go to an established location one way, and then have a second team ferry in food and supply such that you can make it home on the way back and you link up together and they kind of support you, or alternatively, you go out to a location and then they resupply you with food and then come back that same day, meaning you can really bump up how much a 2DAP can keep you going in the field. Well, that's logistically and personnel intensive for most prepared citizens, something certainly to work on, but out of the purview of this video. Whew, okay, let's move on. Next up is the rucksack. The rucksack isn't really what I would consider a tactical bag, so we're gonna keep this component light. The ruck is what most of you know and love. It's a big old 50, 70 liter pack meant for camping and carrying all the things. They certainly have their place and you can even flex them into a tactical environment, but these carry a decent amount of risk. In the context of speed versus capability, this is all in on capability. If anything even slightly sketchy happens, you're jettisoning this bag. It is simply too heavy. That doesn't mean these things are useless. They work well in a more controlled environment if you're close to a base, close to a car, working out of a car, and want to set up a patrol base relatively within a safe zone and then use smaller packs to kind of venture out from that. But generally speaking, I almost never use rucks unless I'm literally just fucking off in the woods for fun. I don't really use it, to be honest. I don't know why I bought it. This brings us to the final category and my new favorite, uh, you know, bag love until I find a new thing to, you know, chase. I'm gonna, uh, some people have called it the 4DAP. It sounds a bit silly to me. So I'm gonna call it the LAP, the large assault pack. It carries a lot of the design philosophies of that assault pack, but it can kind of flex back and forth between the rucksack and the 3DAP assault pack, being in the 40 to 55 liter range. Now, 40 to 55 liters, in my opinion, would qualify it as edging into rucksack range, but here's a cool aspect, you don't actually have to fully load these. With the DG3 especially pushing in the high 60s, relatively speaking, uh, you can effectively just not fill it and downscale it and tighten down all the, the straps and end up with something akin to a 3DAP. This is actually how I have it configured most of the time. The Spur Plat Attack takes this to its extreme. It's a very large rucksack in terms of raw volume, 50 liters, but the way those 50 liters are configured, it, it's more like a 35 to 40 liter bag with a bunch of Alice style pontoon extenders on the outside that kind of are more for mission accessible gear versus actually being able to put anything large in these at all. That ends up with the specific use case for the Platitech Spur is to kind of treat it as a 3DAP with a base load of around 30 to 35 liters, and then you keep your extra 10 to 20 liters for either seasonal specifics, so extra clothes, or extra food and water if you need a mission extension, or you know, whatever, right? 
The DG3 for me, I find works a little better for my seasonal situations where I both have 100 degree summers with all the water around or some locations with no the water around. That sentence made no sense. And then I also have extremely harsh winters where water doesn't matter as much, but now I need a ton of extra exposure gear, you know, clothes, whatever, you know how it works. I also live in the mountains almost universally. So everywhere I go, there's a lot of up, there's a lot of downs, my knees hate my life, and there's very little flat terrain. So there's a lot of exertion for very minimal gain in distance. I find in the summer I can lean into assault style packs, but in the winter I need something much heavier. That makes the DG3 quite appealing to me, as was the Plat Attack. I can download them to 20, 25 pounds, run a really light basic bag with about 24 hours to 48 hours of, you know, consumables, and about 12 hours of waters, all of which of course are scalable. In this configuration, it's certainly light enough to treat like a dedicated assault pack. I can fight in it, you know, the usual. But as the winter starts to come, I begin to scale up where I need to, adding more consumables or capability or weather gear, whatever. So I go from 2DAP to 3DAP, and then eventually I end up in the range of what I would consider a light rucksack at around 40 to 50 pounds. I'll get into heavy details in my dedicated video on this bag. It's by no means perfect, but it actually does okay because I do kind of am a bigger fan of just running a single bag system. Let's make an attempt to kind of sum this up because this was a... I'll be real, this was kind of a schizophrenic video. It's all over the place. So starting out, we need to remember our size is very much going to be dictated on our requirements and our requirements are dictated on our physical ability, our team size, and most importantly, our environment and, and the weather patterns we expect, hot, cold, everything in between. I would consider the assault pack, you know, that small 10 to 20 liter pack, mostly 10 liter, as sort of an augmentation for a very short duration or something where we have an auxiliary way of getting supplies, be it a car, a house, a patrol base, or an actual secondary location with stashed equipment. To me, personally, it feels far more suited for urban type environments. Next up, we go to the 2DAP. The 2DAP for me kind of is a little too small for my needs. I've used one extensively and you can do 24 hours plus with one of these, but the margins are pretty tight and a lot of items that you typically would like to bring, extra ammo, backup food, backup water, is more than likely not gonna be able to happen one of these with one of these. Your sleep system also has to be extremely limited with these unless you're willing to strap stuff to the exterior of the bag. For a lot of people in kind of my environment, you'll typically find the 3DAP is a little more fitting. You can bring a much more robust sleep system, extra clothes, extra food, extra water, or instead of being extra food, extra water, you can kind of push out that mission elapsed time with a 3DAP system. That pushes us into the intermediate category that I've kind of introduced in this video, the LAP, the, the large assault pack, sort of a jack of all trades, master of none. If you find you can get away with a 3DAP or a 2DAP, I would recommend that. These are just built for the task and thus they're far more streamlined and less bulky and you know, frankly floppy when you are underloading one of these LAPs. However, the LAPs with that you know, jack of all trades allows you a degree of flexibility and mission configuration depending on season, depending on how long you want to be out there or how nervous you are about a specific mission. The ability to not only run it in a slimline configuration, basically as a slightly larger 3DAP, but also upload the bag to either add a degree of safety, as in better gear, heavier gear, and more importantly, more food and water, or configure the bag for a much longer mission elapsed time, for example, 72 hours or something to that effect, uh, uh, makes this bag a very flexible and usable bag for the prepared citizen, something I'd like to talk about going into the future. My only word of caution here is you don't want these LAP style bags to just be an excuse to bring all the bullshit. That's not really what these are for. And if you're not experienced in packing and haven't had a lot of practice, you may find you overload even an LAP and you end up with a ridiculously heavy system for no real reason. I think the key to using one of these is having a base load akin to a 2DAP or a 3DAP and then kind of using the added space as a flexibility for different configurations. Okay, thanks for watching. I mean. Let's be real, this video can be summed up with small bag, medium bag, medium plus bag, and the large bag. That's really all that there is to it, but there is a degree of philosophy, chitter chattering, and blabbing, and also this is kind of what I do, uh, such that I can talk for 26 minutes about this bullshit. <laughs> 
So yeah, thanks for watching. I'll, I'll probably talk about the LEP style bag, specifically this DG3 uh, at a future date. Uh, so, you know, look forward or, you know, know to tune out for that one. Thanks for watching, thanks for Venture Surplus, and um, yeah, more or less, if you wanna check out any of these bags, I have them in a description down below. I'll probably use Amazon affiliate links. So if you want, you can take a little bit of money away from Jeffrey Bezos, the Slurp Lord himself, and give me like two cents per your purchase. Uh, every little bit is appreciated. Thanks so much. Anyways, I will see you guys in the next one.